Um, good afternoon, my name is Carolyn Whitnell and I'm here to present a project I was involved in with David McCann and Elizabeth Oswald at the University of Bristol. And as you can see, it's one of the special papers that was uh, actually accepted in spite of having the word practical in the title. Um, <laughs> so David would be the best one to explain it ideally um, as he was responsible for actually building the practical tool mentioned in the title, uh, but he couldn't be here today, so instead you've got me. Um, now, I contributed mainly to the grey box uh, modelling side of things, but I will do my best to do justice to David's creation. Broadly speaking, the paper is about simulating instruction level power consumption in order to detect side channel leakage during software development. So first I'm going to give some motivation, then overview some previous work along similar lines. I'm going to describe our general model building strategy before introducing the ARM Cortex-M family of processors and showing how the model building applies. Then I'm going to explain how the model predictions were integrated into an instruction set emulator in order to emulate not just the data flow, but the power consumption of the data flow of arbitrary data sequences. And then I'll finish by looking at how well the tool performs and exploring some possible uses for it. So what we've been aiming towards is the goal of equipping software designers to detect side channel vulnerabilities in the development stage. So this would hopefully help avoid nasty surprises later down the line and provide an opportunity to make security enhancing adjustments while it is still relatively cheap and easy to do so. We suggest that such a facility would be especially useful in the context of the growing Internet of Things sector, uh, which is fast moving and populated by lots of small startups with minimal resources. So this setting poses particular challenges beyond those arising in the smart card industry. Chip manufacturers, for example, are typically large and well-established, um, and they're used to designing and testing with cryptographic and physical security in mind. They have the resources to afford the services of evaluation labs, or even to support their own in-house expertise. By contrast, small IoT companies are operating in a climate where security considerations are still playing catch-up with rapid innovation. And until the true costs of insecurity are recognised from a demand side, um, suppliers are not well incentivized to make security a priority. Um, and even those with good intent are likely to have limited budgets and expertise to kind of throw in that direction. So this is really where we hope the value of user-friendly diagnostic tools might come in. Um, now, we're not the first to pursue such an idea. Um, existing proposals for simulating side channels mostly fall somewhere along a spectrum between what we call white box and what we call black box modeling. So white box modeling um, relies on the type of detailed circuit level knowledge that can be found in transistor or cell level net lists. Cell level net lists. Um, now this information is used to simulate the transitions occurring in a circuit and simple transition counts can themselves be used to give a proportional approximation of the power consumption. Um, or alternatively, if the capacitive loads of the cell outputs are also known, then the transitions can be mapped more precisely to a power trace prediction. Uh, it's important to remember that even the most comprehensive white box methods are necessarily simplifications to some degree, um, since phenom phenomena such as crosstalk, um, for example, remain outside the scope of netlists. So at the other end of the spectrum are methods which assume only a general knowledge of the algorithm rather than detailed information about the specific implementation. Now these tend to concentrate on modeling the side channel during the processing of known security sensitive values or operations only. The usual way to do this is to collect lots of traces relating to each of the possible values of the target intermediate and to use these to estimate the trace distributions associated with these values. Now, these fitted distributions can then be used as templates, for example, in order to classify new observations according to their initially unknown intermediates. So what we're interested in today are those methods that lie somewhere in the middle. Um, Grey box leakage characterizations do not require detailed circuit level information, but they do assume that something more is known about the implementation than just the underlying algorithm. For example, knowledge of the assembly code permits instruction level modeling and simulation. Now, some previous proposals have operated at this level, but they have tended to rely on simplified assumptions about the data dependent form of the power consumption, um, such as the popular Hamming weight and distance models. However, research into power costs, um, including that done by Tiwari and colleagues, has revealed that the true form it tends to be far more complex. 
The power consumed by a given instruction varies, for example, depending on the instructions around it in a circuit. Um, Tawari's models are not directly suitable for our purposes as um, they average over all possible uh, data inputs. And of course, this obscures away from precisely the variation that we're interested in from a side channel perspective. But they're a good prompt towards the need for more realistically complex uh, characterizations than those previously used to predict instruction level leakage. So this is what we're aiming at in our own work. Um, our contribution is a methodology for building appropriately complex models for instruction level leakages and a tool that uses these models to map the data flow of arbitrary code sequences onto predicted power traces. The tool is called ELMO and as we'll see later it plays a promising role in early stage leakage detection. But first I'm going to talk a bit about how we arrived at the models that it uses. So linear regression provides a natural tool for finding expressions for one variable as a function of a number of others. On the left-hand side, you have the dependent variable that you want to explain or predict. In our case, this is the power consumption. On the right-hand side, you have a linear combination of candidate explanatory variables with unknown coefficients plus some noise. So in our case, the explanatory variables are derived from the data being processed and the assembly code sequence of the device while it's in operation. And the noise is any variation in the left-hand side variable that is not accounted for by the terms on the right-hand side. Um, so it includes measurement error as well as the effect of processes which might not be um, known to the model builder um, or might not be measurable. Um, so the coefficients for this expression are then estimated by minimizing the sum of squares um, of the residuals. The validity of estimates obtained in this way relies somewhat on the assumption that the noise is independent and constant and that none of the explanatory variables can be written as linear combinations of the other explanatory variables. That's what we mean by collinearity. Um, some of the statistical inferences that we're going to rely on later uh, also make use of the additional assumption uh, that the noise is normally distributed. So an important ingredient of any model building process is the ability to quantify and compare model quality um, so that you know when you've arrived at something suitable for purpose. But actually, this is really rather difficult. Um, the quality of a model is essentially its closeness to the underlying reality that it's intended to approximate. Um, so this reality might be known in certain contrived theoretical scenarios, but in real world settings, it's precisely the thing that is unknown uh, and that you're trying to learn. Um, otherwise, there'd be no cause to build a model in the first place. But nonetheless, certain questions can be answered, um, such as the proportion of total variation which is explained by the model. So in the context of linear regression, um, or at least within our application of it, this is measured by the coefficient of determination, or the R squared. Um, however, this figure has to be interpreted with caution. Um, a high R squared, for example, may simply indicate that the model has been overfitted, um, especially when the number of explanatory variables is large relative to the number of data points. It always increases when you add a new explanatory variable, regardless of whether or not the contribution of that variable is truly meaningful. Um, so this makes it entirely unsuitable for choosing between models of different sizes. So an adjusted version does exist, uh, which penalizes for the number of variables. But for the purposes of deciding between models, it is generally recommended to use the F-test. Um, so the F-statistic is a function of the data that, under some reasonable assumptions, follows a known F-distribution if the subset of variables to be tested make no difference when added to the model. If the observed F-statistic is sufficiently outside the likely region of the F-distribution, then the variables are said to be statistically significant. Um, and this is the mechanism that we're going to use to decide what to include and discard from our final models. The F-test can also be used to determine the overall significance of a model, uh, which can be useful especially in the case that the R-squared is low. So a low R-squared indicates that the, that the power consumption is dominated by processes not accounted for in the model. Uh, now these processes might not be known, or they might be unmeasurable, and they might not even be of interest if they're not data dependent in some way, um, although some emitted variables can, can cause the assumptions about the noise to, uh, to become invalid, which is a kind of separate problem. So if the R-squared is low, but the model is overall significant, it may still be useful to explain the relevant data-dependent aspects of the power trace. If the model is not significant, it may mean that the traces do not leak information, 
about the process data. Um, however, it's important to remember that this is not the same thing as saying that the device does not leak information. Uh, it may just be an indication that you need to go back and have a look at your measurement setup and um, try and improve the quality of your traces. The devices that we looked at were members of the ARM Cortex-M processor family. Now, these were introduced in 2004 for use within small microcontrollers. There are six variants. We're going to focus on the M0, which is at the low cost, low power end of the spectrum. And the paper also looks at the more expensive and higher performing M4. But today I'm just going to discuss what we achieved for the M0. So here um, on the left is a simplified diagram of the architecture of an ARM CPU. Um, it comprises an arithmetic logic unit, a hardware multiplier, and a barrel shifter. Uh, and the register banks feed into the ALU via two buses, one of which is also connected to some data in-out registers. And there's a third bus connecting the output of the ALU back into the register bank. The thumb instruction set is a subset of the most commonly used ARM instructions. So they're each 16 bits long, and each of them corresponds to a 32-bit ARM instruction that has the same effect on the processor. Um, now, we identify 21 of these instructions as being particularly important to typical implementations of symmetric cryptography. And they fall into an intuitive grouping according to the different component parts of the architecture that we just saw in um, the diagram. So the largest group are the ALU instructions, uh, add and exclusive or, etc., and variants of these uh, which operate on three-bit immediate values. Uh, sorry, yes, immediate values. Um, and then there are the instructions associated with the barrel shifter, rotate right, logical shift right, and logical shift left. Laws, uh, loads and stores are the next two groups. Uh, these operate with the data out and data in registers, respectively. And multiplication we consider on its own, uh, since ARM features a dedicated multiplier. The open source C program Thumbulator emulates the data flow of arbitrary thumb instruction sequences. And uh, we're going to make use of this existing tool when we come to build our leakage emulator. Um, but first, I'm going to describe the data collection and model building processes that enable mapping the data flow to, uh, to leakage traces. Now, the paper goes into some more detail about the mechanics of the instructions and how we justify our model decisions. Um, so care, for example, is taken as to which of the two 32-bit inputs to each instruction should be treated as the first and which is the second operand. And uh, we ignore instruction outputs under the assumption that these are going to appear as inputs to subsequent instructions and are kind of captured in the leakage in that way. So the M0 that we work with is implemented on an STM discovery board from ST Microelectronics. Um, it features an ST link to flash programs to the processor, and it provides on-chip debugging capabilities, as well as an onboard 8 MHz RC oscillator clock signal. Um, we made some modifications to the board, as listed on the slide, in order to minimize the potential for setup effects. And I've also shown the uh, details of the scope that we used for those interested. Um, this information can, of course, be found in full in the paper. We empirically chose a sampling rate of 500 mega samples per second and reduced noise in our measurements by averaging over five, acquisitions per, uh, five traces per acquisition. Um, the inputs and instruction sequences that we collected data for were chosen according to the various stages of our model building process. So the first thing that we wanted to do was simply to look at the standalone leakage forms of each of the 21 instructions and see if they met our uh, intuitive expectations. So to achieve this, we collected 5,000 traces for each instruction for varying operands. Um, to minimize code sequence effects, we sandwiched the instruction in each case between two move instructions. And we selected the maximum peak of the clock cycle in which the target instruction was performed and fitted simple models for the measured power consumption in function of the individual bits of both operands and the bit transitions between the operands and the operands to the previous instructions. So that's kind of related to the Hamming distance um, logic. Uh, so all of the models that we tested in this way were overall significant. And there were discernible differences in the form of the leakage between the different instructions. For example, load instructions depend only on the bits of the operand and not on the bit flips. Um, while store instructions depend only on the bits and bit transitions of the second operands, 
the multiplication does not depend on the bit transitions of the second operand, and all other instructions depend on all tested variables, um, with the exception of those uh, operating on immediates, uh, which essentially have no second operand. To allow us to eventually increase model complexity, um, we wanted at this stage to remove as much redundancy as possible. So one way to do this would be to group like instructions so as to reduce the number of distinct instructions we needed to include in the further stages of the analysis. So we represented each instruction by its data-dependent coefficients and performed a hierarchical cluster analysis on them. Now, the arrangements discovered confirmed our a priori intuition. Um, for the best quality clustering according to the silhouette index, um, ALU stores, loads, shifts, and multiplications separated out into five distinct groups. And we therefore decided to proceed with a representation from each. Uh, so this figure shows the data-dependent coefficients for the representative instructions, um, the exclusive or uh, the, the, oh goodness, the left, logical shift left, isn't it? Sorry, <laughs> the store, the load, and the multiplication. Um, <laughs> uh, and you can see uh, by comparing this with um, the uh, mean data dependent coefficients for the groups that they represent, that the match is really very close um, in terms of the form of the data dependent power consumption. So this is really useful. It means that um, we can uh, confidently reduce our list of instructions to just these five representatives, um, which makes it much easier to add, in, add uh, useful complexity to our final models. So in particular, uh, we want to eventually model instructions in sequences of three, um, and now we only need to consider 125 possible combinations uh, rather than 21 cubed, which is um, over 9,000. Uh, so to, to, to build these models which take sequence effects into account, um, we collected 1,000 traces for each combination with random data inputs. And we interleave the sequences within a single acquisition in order to, to minimize the possibility of conflating instruction effects with drift or acquisition effects. We mean-centered them to adjust for overall drift and uh, again compress them to a single point in each clock cycle. And we chose, in each case, the clock cycle most strongly associated with the inputs to the target instruction. Uh, we then built models of the same form as before, uh, with the addition of dummy variables indicating the previous and subsequent instructions. Um, but because it's the data dependency of the trace that we are most interested in, we uh, additionally allow for differential data dependent effects by fitting four sets of interaction terms. So these take the form of the product of the instruction dummies with the Hamming weights of each operand and also with the corresponding Hamming distances. Uh, the differential data effects are found to be jointly significant in almost all cases. Um, only in the case of the store model are we led to conclude that operand one and transition two terms could be removed without cost to the model. So an obvious limitation of the model so far is that it uh, restricts the relationship between the leakage and the data bits to be linear. Now, of course, in practice, it's perfectly reasonable to suppose that bits carried on adjacent wires, for example, might produce an interaction effect. And we therefore tested the inclusion of adjacent and non-adjacent interactions. And as it happens, we did find significant effects precisely and only where we might expect to, um, in the leakages of the shifts and the multiplication. Now, these instructions explicitly involve the joint manipulation of bits within the operands. Um, we also tested for adjacent bit flip interactions, uh, and these are not found to contribute significantly towards any of the instruction leakages. So our final models for use by the simulator therefore include sequence dependence data interactions in all cases and input bit interactions in the case of shifts and multiplications only. So we now have our five model equations which allow us to predict the power consumption for each of our five representative thumb instructions. And what we actually want is to be able to predict the power consumption for arbitrary code sequences. And this is where the thumbulator comes in. So the thumbulator tool takes as an input a binary program in thumb assembly. Um, it decodes and executes each instruction sequentially with the capability to trace the instruction and memory flow for the purposes of debugging. So we adapt this to also store the data flow. Uh, so so that's, that is the values of the operands in a linked list data structure. 
And this information is then used as input to the model equations, um, which produces a predicted power consumption trace associated with the code segment of interest. So let's take a look at what uh, the tool actually produces. So a first obvious thing that we would like to check is how well the model predictions correlate with the measured traces. Uh, now the top figure here shows the correlation between the Hamming weight of the first round output and measurements taken from the M0 as it performs AES. And the second figure shows the corresponding correlation trace when the Hamming weight model is replaced with our ELMO model prediction. So we can easily see that the ELMO model captures leakage information beyond that characterized by the Hamming weight, uh, which really implies that the Hamming weight model is not, in this instance, adequate for the purposes of simulation, and that our more complex models are better suited to the task. An especially useful application for the tool is in automated leakage detection. So Goodwill et al. proposed a set of procedures based on classical hypothesis tests. Um, in a non-specific uh, non fixed versus random test, two sets of traces are collected from the target device. One of these has random data inputs, and the other has a specially chosen fixed input. A Welch's two-sample t-test is used to decide whether at each point in the trace, the two groups have significantly different mean power consumption. And any trace point where such a significant difference is found is considered to leak information. So uh, we're going to show an example of ELMO traces being used in this manner to detect a subtle leak in a supposedly protected AES operation. So the idea behind masking is to divide all sensitive intermediates into statistically independent shares, which only reveal the original uh, variable when recombined. So if you implement it perfectly, it's able to thwart standard DPA attacks. Um, but careless implementation uh, can infamously introduce unanticipated leakages. So we selected a segment of code uh, shown here um, that implements masked shift roads. Uh, but there is a vulnerability in it, which an implementer who is not experienced at looking out for side channels might not be able to spot. So because the rotate right operation leaks a function of the bit flips from the previous data operands, there could be a problem if the prior instruction is protected by the same mask. So this figure shows the outcome of a fixed versus random test to detect arbitrary leaks arising from the code sequence. The dotted lines show the typical threshold of 4.5 recommended by Goodwill et al. for deciding on whether peaks are significant. And you can see that leakage is detected in the ELMO traces for the, inspected instru for the expected instructions. Uh, the bottom panel shows the same leakage test performed on real trace measurements. And this closely matches the conclusions drawn from the ELMO analysis. Now, there is some lingering leakage in the cycles after the final load, which is not discovered in our analysis of the ELMO traces. So we believe this results from the fact that our models are constructed at instruction level rather than clock cycle level. Uh, this means that leakage arising from a particular instruction is therefore tied to the cycle in which the instruction is performed. So this uh, seems to degrade the visual similarity of our simulations, but it has the big advantage that we can easily track back to the offending instruction. Uh, so, in short, um, our tool is able to capture vulnerabilities in arbitrary code sequences. It replicates leakages that go undiscovered in simulations relying on standard assumptions, such as the Hamming weight. And it can be used in place of real measurements taken from a concrete device to locate problem instructions in the software development stage. The procedure that we follow is appropriate for use with different devices and side channels. And it's a natural first step towards a variety of useful applications, such as the automated insertion and testing of countermeasures. Uh, related possibilities include, for example, the optimization of protected code with respect to energy efficiency. And the tool itself uh, is available, or is going to be available for download from GitHub. Uh, see the URL at the bottom of the stuff. Um, okay, thank you very much. Any questions? All right, come on. Who's got questions? There are microphones lined up in the aisles. Hi. Um, to what extent is this uh, general in the sense that um, 
if a program does leak information on some processor, this will cut, this will find it. Um, so I think you, you kind of need to build the models uh, separately for each uh, device that you want to simulate for. So you do need to have an idea of what it's going to be implemented on eventually. Um, obviously, there's other things around um, leakage resilient uh, cryptograph cryptography that tries to deal with it in a more general manner that will be uh, independent of the device. But yeah, this is not that at all. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, I have two questions. So uh, one, how long does it take? So if I want to use this when I'm writing some code and I'm generating like an implementation of AES, how do, how do, how do I use this? Do I, do I have to simulate or are there like static checkers you can build from the model that you can then say like, hey, don't generate these instructions? Um, so you mean having already built the emulator? So you, you just need the assembly code. Uh, so you, you've already written your program that you want to test in that sense. Um, and then are you asking how long it takes to actually generate the simulated traces when you run it? Or Yeah, so I guess I, I'm, I'm implementing something and do I like wait for like a couple of days and they're like, nope, hey, there's a... Okay, so um, I, oh, I, unfortunately, the, it's mostly my colleague who's actually generated the simulations, but um, I know from interacting with him that he's come back very quickly with... Um, Sorry, this is a really non-technical answer, but um, from experience, it, it's, it's quite rapid. It, there's no kind of big overhead of, uh, it's not, we're not talking days, um, basically. Right. Yeah, okay. Just kind of within a chunk of time, that, within a, yeah. Right. <laughs> within that a chunk of reasonable. time, <laughs> <Okay>. sorry. <laughs> um, I guess my other question, maybe this is more closer to what you were uh, uh, doing, but uh, did, assuming uh, I, that the noise is, um, linear and the whole model being linear, I guess like as an attacker, don't I have control over the chip and can start beaming EM rays at this thing to, to affect? Um, well, to some degree that, so linear regression assumes that the, the variables that you fit, it, that it's um, linear in those variables, but those variables, variables themselves can be nonlinear functions of the data as, as we showed with our interactions. So uh, I guess, in principle, you can extend the model to incorporate those more complex forms that you expect to see based on whatever the attacker has done to make something uh, less linear. Yeah. So does that does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Thanks. I wanted to ask a follow-up to Richard's question, and I'm not a hardware person, so pardon me if I'm if this isn't entirely informed. But what would you to tell the hardware designers of the next generation so they don't fall prey to people like you? And um, what do you tell the faculty members in this room to teach the people who are going to be the hardware designers? So, you know, you know how do we generalize? I, I feel like this is a really interesting, very niche uh, issue you've identified. Um, I, I'm very much the wrong person to ask about how, how to teach hardware designers since I'm neither a teacher nor a hardware designer. But um, I, guess, I guess what we're trying to say is that um, to have tools that you can explain the basic principles of to, to a designer and then encourage them to... Um, I suppose this, this principally is for software designers anyway because it's in order to test code on devices that someone else has made. But um, I think it, the principle is the same that you, you have tools that you don't need expertise for but then you hope that some degree of knowledge of those tools is sufficient. All right. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks.